A reading from the book of Genesis. God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and the cattle, and over all the wild animals and all the creatures that crawl on the ground. God created man in his image. In the divine image, he created him, male and female. He created them. God blessed them, saying, Be fertile and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and all the living things that move on the earth. God also said, See, I give you every seed-bearing plant all over the earth, and every tree that has seed-bearing fruit on it to be your food and to all the animals of the land, all the birds of the air, and all the living creatures that crawl on the ground, I give all the green plants for food. And so it happened. God looked at everything he had made, and he found it very good. Evening came, and morning followed, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth and all their array were completed. Since on the seventh day God was finished with the work he had been doing, God rested on the seventh day from all the work he had undertaken. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work he had done in creation. The word of the Lord. Lord. Give success to the work of our hands. Before the mountains were begotten and the earth and the world were brought forth, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turned men back to dust, saying, Return, O children of men. For a thousand years in your sight are as yesterday now that it is past, or as a watch of the night. Lord, give us the Lord, Lord. Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain wisdom of heart. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Lord, give us the Lord, Lord. Fill us at daybreak with your kindness, that we may shout for joy and gladness all our days. Let your work be seen by your servants and your glory by their children. Dominus Fobiscum. Lexio Sancti Evangelis Secundum Matteum. Jesus came to his native place and taught the people in their synagogue. They were astonished and said, where did this man get such wisdom and mighty deeds? Is he not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother named Mary and his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Are not 
his sisters all with us. Where did this man get all this? And they took offense at him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his native place and in his own house. And he did not work many mighty deeds there because of their lack of faith. Verbum Domini. We are delighted to have our young ladies singing for us today on this feast of St. Joseph the Worker. And we have a treat for you that the post-communion hymn today was actually written by our good friend Donna. And it's a, a, a song that she recently wrote in honor of St. Joseph. They'll be singing that as her post-communion hymn today. I'd also like to I bring to your attention a group, Hosanna Association. It's an international group that encourages people to pray, and I think it's directed in large part by young people who are encouraging people to offer a decade of the rosary every day during the month of May, at least one, as a rose to give to Our Lady and their goal is to have a million decades of the rosary prayed during the month of May. Certainly, the world and needs it at this time. Certainly, we need Our Lady's help in the challenges that we face today. So I encourage you to perhaps visit their website. They have an a app, Rosario, where you can pray the rosary. Of course, EWTN has our own on-demand where you can always pray the rosary. We have a variety of ros rosaries there. We air the rosary actually four times a day. So especially this month of May, we want to take up that cause of entrusting the needs and burdens and troubles of the world to Our Lady. A couple of years ago, I had to have some plumbing work done at my mother's house. And I was asking the plumber because I knew that he had worked with my Uncle Don. My Uncle Don and his partner, Benny, had a plumbing business there in Cascade, Iowa, B&D Plumbing. And I asked him if he knew Don or he remembers, and he says, oh, yes. And I said, well, what do you remember about working with them? He said, they were whistling all the time. <laughs> He didn't seem to be too happy about that memory. And I don't want to encourage you to, to always whistle when you're working, especially if it's aggravating somebody. But I do want to encourage that attitude to carry out your work cheerfully. As for the Lord, as St. Paul would write in Colossians, do it wholeheartedly for the Lord. You're doing it for Him. In fact, in our work, as we remember St. Joseph the Worker this day, that it's really a participation in God's creative work, a continuing of His work of creation. And so it has a particular dignity in it that we are called to exercise the gifts that he has given us, the particular talents and experiences that we've had, and to utilize them to improve the situation, right, in our, in our circumstances, to serve others. And we think about Jesus, he spent 30 years, most of his life, doing manual labor. Do you ever think about that? And so in today's gospel, this same event that's recounted in today's gospel from Matthew is recounted in Mark. And in Matthew 13 that we had today, is this not the carpenter's son? In Mark, they say he has another thing that people were saying, is this not the carpenter? Both were true. He was the carpenter's son and he was a carpenter for 30 years, most of his 
life the Son of God spent doing manual labor. And so what he is showing us there is the value and the dignity of it. When it's done for the love of God, when it's done for the love of our families. And when Jesus washed feet, he said, I've given you an example that you may do. He found no contradiction in the example of his own father, Joseph, and the different illustrations that he had in his life. And we learned something else too, that Joseph was a mentor to Jesus in his childhood. In fact, if you go to the church of St. Joseph in Nazareth, which is re reputedly built over the home where the Holy Family lived, there is an area there that's where, where his workplace is believed to have been. And they have this portrait of the Holy Family with Joseph there and the child Jesus, and he's teaching him the trade of carpentry. And so this mentoring is a big part of it. You know, as part of my preparation, I noticed when I typed in St. Joseph the Worker that a homily that Father Mitch gave in 20, 2012 came up. And so I had to listen to it, of course, on May 1st, 2012. And I highly encourage you to, to listen to that homily because he gives a lot of the historical reasons why Pope Pius XII instituted this feast in 1955, and it began in Chicago, his own hometown, as he said. It was in 1886 that there were different tensions going on. He brought up a statistic which uh, I found astounding. He said in, the 17, in 1790, 90% 90 of people were farmers in 1790. But by the 1890, only 15% were farmers because people were now working in the fa factories. There was the Industrial Revolution. And often there was a lot, uh, people were working ungodly hours. And so there were these different tensions that were going on at the time. And so this led to First, you know, the, the seeing of the individual as a cog in the wheel in the Industrial Revolution by some of the owners. These people are just cogs in the wheel. And then socialism and communism took it further that these people are expendable. Okay, if this person will work them to death, they have their labor camps, they have those sorts of things. And if they die because of this, well, we'll just get somebody else. And so Pope Pius XII institutes this feast to show, yes, the dignity of work, but it's not an end in itself. And always the dignity of the worker is something that has to be acknowledged and respected and upheld. The, the dignity of that particular work and their particular needs, not just their service to the work, although of course that's a good contribution that they're making, but also the dignity of the individual. It's also one of the reasons that I chose today's first reading as well. Because what did we hear from the book of Genesis? That God created man in his image. In the divine image he created him, male and female, he created them. And so we have this dignity and recently the Vatican issued this document a dignitatis infinitum, infinita, the infinite dignity of man. And they actually quote this passage from Genesis talking about the dignity of the human person. But God gives our first parents work to do, fill the earth and subdue it. And so they are given a task, again, is a continuation of God's own creative work. And I like something that Pope St. John Paul II, and actually this document was issued on the 19th anniversary of Pope John Paul's death. And he's quoted twice in that document, at least twice, and his, his document, um, uh, Evangelium Vitae, 
the gospel of life. But he, he also wrote something on the observance of the Lord's day, dies domini, something that I think we've kind of forgotten in so many ways in our culture today, observing the Lord's day, keeping it holy. And he talks about the Lord's, God's rest after his creation in today's first reading. And he said, it would be banal to interpret God's rest as a kind of divine inactivity. Jesus, in fact, defending his own work on the Sabbath, said, my fathers are working still and I am working. What is God's rest then? Pope John Paul says, it speaks as it were of God's lingering before the very good work which his hand has wrought in order to cast upon it a gaze full of joyous delight. This is a contemplative gaze which does not look to new accomplishments, but enjoys the beauty of what has already been achieved. It is a gaze which God casts upon all things, but in a special way upon man, the crown of his creation. So it is good for us when we've done a hard work. We've done, I remember being on the farm and, okay, you're gonna paint this fence. Well, it looks like it's a mile long. <laughs> but when you've finished painting that fence, there's a feeling of accomplishment. You can kind of sit back and you could look at that beautiful white fence and that you took part in God's creative work to, to beautify his creation there in your own place, in your own situation. So there's a place for us to enjoy what we've accomplished. And that's where the Lord's day helps us to do that. It doesn't all depend on us. We depend on God's providence and to, to observe the Lord's day, to keep it holy um, as much as we can, avoiding making other people work as well. But making it a day of rest, a day of family, a day of maybe visiting the lonely, those sorts of charitable things that we can do uh, on the Lord's day to keep it a day that is holy. So work is, is good, it has a dignity, but it's not an end in itself. It's not uh, that we are cogs in the wheel and that has to be the all-consuming thing in our life. No, there's something greater. And it is work that actually helps us to grow in developing our personalities, developing our skills, developing our interaction with others and working with others. That helps us to become even more fully human. And so it does have this dignity, but it is not an end in itself. Jesus continually refers to human work in his parables. The shepherd, the farmer, the sower, the householder, the servant, the steward, the fisherman, the merchant. Paul speaks of his trade as a tent maker. And to the Thessalonians he wrote, if one won't work, let him not eat. So we have our own contributions to make. And you know, I probably wield a hammer like my dad did. And probably Jesus did wield a hammer like Joseph did. Often sons reflect something of their own fathers in the way that they've mentored them and the different skills that they have taught them. And we can always be creative. No, how, no, no matter how small the tasks that we are doing or seemingly insignificant, there's always a little bit of ourselves that we can put into everything that we do. And the smallest things done with charity, as St. Therese reminds us, have an eternal quality about them. And where there's love, there's no labor. Whatever we put, do with love. Again, from St. Paul's letter to the Colossians, whatever your work is, put your heart into it as if it were for the Lord and not for men, knowing that the Lord will repay you by making you his heirs 
It is Christ the Lord you are serving. That's why we're doing what we do, and we do it with love. And I'd just like to conclude with this quotation about uh, how men typically work as we think about St. Joseph today and his work and also Jesus, as I said, being a manual labor, a blue collar worker, if you will, for the majority of his life. And this is kind of a quote that sums up how virtuous men work. One of the qualities of virtuous men is that they quietly carry out their responsibilities and work without looking for acclaim or applause. Enough for them is the satisfaction that comes from doing things as they ought to be done, doing them well and letting one's actions speak for themselves. Actions speak louder than words, it is said. And the virtuous man is happy to reveal his love for God and for others by his quiet service and unacclaimed efforts. Jesus washed feet and told the disciples that he had just given them an example of how they were to act. Jesus witnessed Joseph's silent service as he was growing in age and wisdom in Nazareth. The gospel Jesus taught found no contradiction in Joseph.